Good morning, everyone. We'll go ahead and get our class started. I'm going to, uh, under the uh, strict demands of our sound and audio, I'm going to run this microphone around to you. If you have something of a lengthy to say, um, sometimes Eduardo only answers with just single words. But uh, we, I won't run the mic to him. But if he starts talking too much, I will. Otherwise, uh, to make sure that the recording hears everybody, I know it's a little bit of a hassle, but uh, everybody, uh, the people that are watching us on video, on uh, social media, they would like to hear the discussion. They don't always want to just hear me. I know Elaine does. But not everybody does. So let's open up our, our class with prayer. <clears throat> our Heavenly Father, we appreciate the time we can gather in your house of worship together in one unity. And we ask as we discuss this lesson that we have a great understanding of how important other people are in our lives and how we can benefit others and that we would like to share the same humble type of character that you had as we serve others and as we help others as well. We thank you in your name. Amen. So, this lesson study, unto the least of these, we're going to start, we're going to talk about uh, Jesus' ministry on earth and how through his uh, through his life, uh, we can see how important all people were to him. So, memory text. <clears throat> then the Father will say to those on his right hand, "Come, you blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world." Matthew twenty-five thirty-four. The Bible speaks often of, of the strangers, sometimes called aliens, the fatherless, the widows. They may be the ones whom Jesus referred to as the least of these, my brethren. How can we identify these people today? The strangers of, the, of Bible times were individuals who had to leave their homeland, perhaps because of war famine, the equivalent, equivalent in our day could be the millions of refugees who have become destitute because of circumstances that they did not choose. And we see that today. We hear about the refugees, uh, the refugees <coughs> coming here to the United States right now because of the Ukrainian war. Uh, refugees coming from other parts of the world because of, uh, of war and famine and such. Wait, 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 wait. I think some of, I was thinking this week in the lesson about the concept, you know, who are the least of these? And the thought came to me, the least of these is those that for whatever reason we deem as other. That we consider as other. <laughs> so not in the same social class as us, not someone we would normally associate with, anyone that is other than us. Okay, so you're implying take you're implying take the focus off of us and put it on others okay others the least of these okay Sunday's lesson the life in ministry of Jesus Okay. Early in his public ministry, Jesus traveled to Nazareth, to Nazareth in the region of Galilee. This was his hometown. The local people already had heard of his work and miracles. As his custom was, Jesus attended uh, the Sabbath, Sabbath services. Let's look, look at uh, Luke chapter 4. Luke chapter 4, 16 through 19. 
So he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the book, prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it, <coughs> it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Okay. Found in uh, Isaiah 61, 1 and 2. So Jesus stood up, made this, uh, and, and they gave him the book of Isaiah. Jesus opened it up, found these verses, and started reading them. What's significant is that, is it, does anybody have, does anybody have their Bible open up to Isaiah 61, 1 and 2? The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me, because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek. He hath sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of the prison to them that are bound, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord, and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn. The day of vengeance of the Lord. Jesus left that out when he read, when we read him here, the day, the vengeance, the day of the vengeance of the Lord. Why do you think he left that out? You just read uh, uh, from Isaiah 61, 1 and 2, and, and, it's and it's quoted here in Luke. Jesus left that part out. What was Jesus' focus? And why do you think he left the day of the vengeance of the Lord? Okay? I believe one reason why he left it out was because he was talking um, not just to a large group, but also to the Pharisees. And they were offended that he called them captives because even though they were under Roman rule, they did not consider themselves captives. And I don't believe that they would understand at that point in time about the vengeance of the Lord because that would just infuriate them more because they thought they were the saved, the only ones. Okay. Uh, so, try not to upset the Pharisees. Okay. Anybody else trying to understand where Jesus' focus was here. That, those verses were very important to the Jewish nation. Especially the very phrase that Jesus left out. The day of the vengeance of the Lord. That gave all the Jewish people hope that when J the Messiah came, the day of vengeance was when the Gentiles would by, finally be eliminated and being taken out and there would be no more control over the Jewish nation. The day of vengeance coming of the Lord was the time of retribution against the Gentiles, the Romans, and all those. And it would be the acceptable year of the Lord. So, rather than trying to take because Jesus left that out. In leaving that out, he left the focus on something else. That phrase that he did leave out was very instrumental to all the Jewish people. It meant there was hope. It meant there was something worthy coming of the Messiah. That this Messiah was coming with vengeance against the Gentile nations. But Jesus here is implying what? What is the focus? What is his focus? To preach 
the gospel to the poor, the set, set uh, he sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, set at liberty those who are oppressed, the ones in prison, not meaning in less necessary in prison, but the ones that are oppressed, give liberty and to preach the acceptable year of the year of the Lord. Acceptable. What's Yeah, I've got some notes here that suggest that it could have been a sabbatical year or a year of Jubilee. Okay. Which uh, to them they knew that was, you know, the land at rest, um, the land going back to the original owners, um, you know, relief from debt. So they had an historical uh, thought on, uh, on this. And here Christ is saying and bringing to their attention that uh, he is probably that. Okay. Okay. And he's bringing that, that, that freedom that they had um, seen just in temporal things. Okay. So it, it, in, in essence, Jesus is implying, given implications or even given sort of the idea that this is the acceptable year of the Lord, the Jubilee, that everything to set the captive free, to heal, to take care of, to preach to the brokenhearted, the accept, acceptable year of the Lord, the acceptable, preach the acceptable year of the Lord. Okay. Puts the focus and it asks us in that in that question on Sunday, what did it reveal? These verses reveal about the work of the Messiah. <clears throat> revealed that Jesus came, came, and, and and that's what is interesting for the reason why Jesus left that last little phrase out. He left it out specifically to say that's not the focus. This is not the focus that you are hoping for. The focus is, is that the acceptable year of the Lord is, is Jesus bringing good news through the gospel that there is hope for the brokenhearted, there is hope and there is healing for the sick, there is hope for the ones that are oppressed, feeling like that there is nothing, no, no other, uh, nothing that they can do. That's the acceptable year of the Lord. And it had nothing to do with the idea that the Romans were going to be taken out of power or anything like that. That they were, that's what they were hoping for. That's the accept, acceptable year that they were hoping for says at the bottom of Sunday's lesson, pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. James 1.27, how should this verse help us set our religious priorities? Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. So, it's quite interesting. This come out of James. And who is James? Brother of Jesus. Brother of Jesus. So, and of course James, we know, been Acts. James was set up to be uh, the head there in Jerusalem, there during the council. Uh, and, and it's interesting that uh, if we look back in the Gospels, we know that in the very first part of Jesus' ministry, and actually when probably at this time when Jesus went back to Nazareth, the very first time were probably, what, uh, maybe about a year, three months into his ministry, maybe, into his ministry of three and a half years, he's gone back to Nazareth for the first time, and that's when he... He enters into the church where his parents attend, most likely. Uh, that's where he's reading the scriptures. 
Isaiah, most likely his brothers, sisters, are there with him, and uh, they uh, pretty much uh, had strong words about you don't need to be getting out of line here or anything like that. Uh, they were more concerned about trying to appeal to general public, and Jesus was saying, Jesus pretty much said, I, I don't have family. My ministry is to the to the broken heart. So it's interesting that James here is very, uh, very upfront regards to what's our focus? Pure and undefiled religion for God and the Father is this: to visit orphans and widows in their trouble, and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Where is our religious priorities today? Do we follow the same? Visiting, taking care of the widows and the orphans in their trouble and to keep oneself unspotted from the world. Summarized pretty well. Helping others but not being a part of it, not letting the, not letting the blemishes of this world overpower us. Pretty much following and staying close to God. So, uh, we have a scripture there, Matthew 11, 1 to 6, where John the Baptist's disciples came to Jesus and said, are you who we're looking for, or do we look for somebody else? But just like you were just saying, he just gave examples. Uh, he didn't say he was the Messiah, but he gave examples. He's seen the blind heal, you know, on and on and on. Uh, so his example was more important uh, to look at you know, how he treated his fellow man. So at the bottom of the lesson yet, Jesus' love for the poor was one of the greatest evidences of his messiahship, messiahship as seen in how Jesus answered John the Baptist's question about him as the Messiah. Matthew 11, 1 through 6. Matthew 11. Now it came to pass when Jesus finished commanding his 12 disciples that he departed from there to teach and to preach in, in their cities. And when John had heard in prison about the works of Christ, he sent two of his disciples and said to him, Are you coming? Are you the coming one? Or do we look for another? Jesus answered and said to them, Go and tell John the things which you hear and see, the blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them, and blessed is he who is not offended because of me. Okay? John was in prison for about six months at this time. He's sitting there wondering why sitting there wondering if, uh, if uh, the purpose in his life was worth it, was necessary, was fulfilling. And starting to consider, well, was I right? Was Jesus the one? So Jesus, I think, uh, where is it also at? Uh, is it in Luke? Um, I think it's Luke that gives the same, that talks about the same situation. And, but before, I think that 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 description more or less implies that Jesus did not take their question, knew their reasoning for coming, but did not take their question, but yet continued to heal the sick, continue to preach, continue to uh, give sight to the blind, hearing to the deaf, 
And by, at the end of the day, he finally took their question, are you the one? And he implied, well, go back and tell them everything that you have seen here today. And so it, gives, it seems like that's a little bit better of an of a idea of how Jesus presented himself in front of those two disciples by allowing them to sit there for most of the day uh, and then to see everything that Jesus had done and to still come up and to say the question, are you the one? If, and in your mind, you, you wonder, wow, how could these two, how could John the Baptist even? He had been hearing, he'd been in prison for six months. He's got another six months before he is beheaded. He's been, he was in prison for about a year, and about six months has gone by, but he has been hearing all the things that Jesus has been doing. But yet still, John the Baptist was not much different from the rest, even Jesus' own disciples, thinking Jesus' mission was here on earth. But still, it just, it just amazes you to think John the Baptist, of all, hearing the miracles and still have to ask the question, are you the one? But Jesus pretty much put it out there by saying, my mission is here on earth is to serve and to heal and to help and to preach all to the brokenhearted, to the sick, to the deaf, to the blind, to the ones that are need to be set free. So, God's provision for the poor, Leviticus 23, 22, gives us the, uh, uh, how people are to take care of their fields. 23, 22 says that when you reap the harvest of your land, you shall not wholly reap the corners of your field when you reap, nor shall you gather any gleaning from your harvest. You shall leave them for the poor and for the stranger. I am the Lord your God. Deuteronomy 15, 11. Deuteronomy 15, 15, 11 says, For the poor will never cease from the land, therefore I command you, saying, You shall open your hand wide to your brother, to your poor and your needy in your hand. Okay. Jesus, God here explaining how you're supposed to take care of your fields. And the one thing in Deuteronomy, it says, you will have the poor with you forever. How, how are we to grow accustomed to that? How are we to try and manage that? Now, as in Leviticus, it gives specific directions. You're not to go ahead and, and go out there and get and take every piece of wheat in every uh, from in your whole area of your field, and and then above all else, when you glean, when you harvest, don't go there and sweep up every little kernel. Let stuff go. Okay. Most of your farmers would have them okay, that's what you're implying. People don't want others on their property. Correct. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, so in a lot of ways, there's signs on everybody's property. Do not trespass. Do not come. Uh, beware. You will be arrested. 
So other, for the most part then, we have come to other ways to help the poor then. Okay, is it become a better, manageable? Obviously, because obviously we're not going to demand that, hey, we're not going to help the poor. You need to go out into the fields and go pick your own grain. Uh, things have changed, obviously. We've come to a better sophistication of trying to help the poor. And as Deuteronomy says, the poor will be, us, will be with us forever. Do we do enough? Does anybody ever think they do enough? At what point do you feel confident that you have done enough? Is there a point? Is there a, is there a certain amount? Okay, God says it will be with us all the way to the end. So we have to help the poor all the way to the end. Is that just one poor person? Huh. So, and, okay, so is it spontaneous? Or you just say, oh, I'm going to just help. I'll do so much every time. Can you limit it? I was listening to a sermon this morning before I came in, and one of the quotes that the pastor said was that he believed that the poor will always be with us so that the rich will learn to have compassion. And I believe that our limit is a case by case, person by person, because sometimes people you come across need more, and you sacrifice, not just give what you can, but you sacrifice for yourself to give to them. And there are some that need very little and you sacrifice to give what you can to them. Okay. Okay. So at certain times, you sacrifice what you can out of the feeling the necessity that something else needs, someone else needs it more than you. Okay. Okay. Tuesday's lesson, the rich young ruler, and we all love this one, the rich young ruler, we can just sit here and we can just all criticize this individual, we found out his weakness, we know it all, we don't know much about the rich young ruler, but we'd certainly be able to criticize him. Uh, and he had an interest in spiritual things. He was so energetic that he came running to Jesus. He was excited to learn about eternal life. The story is so important that it is recorded in, all, in, in three of the, of the uh, Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And we'll read about it in Mark chapter 19. 19, 16 through 22. Now behold, one came and said to him, Good teacher, what good things shall I do that I may have eternal life? So, we have an idea right there. Individual, this rich young ruler. He is seeking something more. What do you think rich, young, ruler, in your mind, how do you summarize this individual? Who is he? What is he? Seems to, he seems to be somewhat independent because he's very confident in himself. Rich, young, ruler. Maybe he's an individual that is, you can't say that he's Pharisee or Sadducee because he's young. In your mind, you think that he's young and, and must be his own entrepreneur, have his own business, something like that, done very well, but he's young. 
that weighs on your mind. But he is seeking information. He wants to know. Is he earnest? He's earnest, okay, in what he's searching for. He's earnest. Why? Why is he earnest? Why do you think? Is there, is there something bothering him? What is it about eternal life that he really wants to know? He is, re he is confident in himself. He's just done everything, but yet he still wants to know one, one, a little bit more what needs to be done. Well, he's actually trying to find out what he can do to find favor from the Lord. And the lesson let us understand that there's nothing of us, there's nothing we can do to get us to that state. It's the other way around. The Lord has already loved us. He wants to, he already said, I've done all those things. What else needs to be done? I mean, what can I do more to be presented good before the Lord? And we all know the story. Jesus went beyond his expectation and Jesus also knew him so well that the things he has done are things he feel, I mean, that it's not sacrificial for him. Jesus went to the point of going beyond your comfort zone because all he had done was within his comfort zone. So Jesus went beyond that point. His focus was on his wealth, give it all out and come follow me. So that was the end of the story. He couldn't let that go. Okay. Okay. When Jesus was telling him what he could do, like don't murder and stuff of that nature, he left out the tenth commandment, which was covetousness. And like Brother here said, he didn't want to give up what he was coveting, his riches and all the wealth that he had had. Okay. And that was the point that when the Lord said, go sell everything you have, that was the tenth commandment that he was not willing to follow. Okay. So, when we split the ten commandments in two parts, that obedience to God, and the, and the other half, obedience to man, Jesus here pretty much just summarized, it gave everything uh, in regards to obedience to man, Matthew chapter uh, 19, Uh, Matthew 19, 16 through 22. Uh, why do you call me good? No one is good but one. That is God. But if you want to enter into life, keep the commandments. He said to him, which ones? He said, you shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. Honor your father and your mother. And you shall not love your neighbor as yourself. And sure enough, the other one that uh, that is obedience to man is do not covet Jesus left that out the young man said to him all these things I have kept from my youth what do I still lack all these I have kept from my youth but what do I still lack Jesus said if you want to be perfect go sell what you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me but when the young man heard that saying he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. He hadn't come to the place to really even understand those things completely. He was doing what he understood, what he had been taught in the synagogue and stuff. But those things are actually <coughs> impossible for us to do in our own strength. That we don't even know what to do right without praying um, because Christ, God, is the only one who can give us that understanding. Can, uh, uh, I was thinking on that this week for myself, that I need to pray to, uh, through the Holy Spirit that I might uh, that we need Christ and, and not have to help us understand them. We we really can't understand them in our own strength. That we actually need to uh, pray that we're given the wisdom through through the Holy Spirit to 
understand this thing. We can't do it. Okay. Okay, we can't do it on our own. And we need prayer. This individual said, I've done all this all the way since my youth. I've done it all. Pretty confident, isn't he? Pretty self, self-centered, self-assured. I have done all that from my youth. I, I have done that. This individual had a chart at home. You can only imagine, he had a chart. I fulfilled this, I fulfilled this. Every week, monthly, yearly, I've done this, I've done this, all the way from my youth. He was perfect. We talk about perfection. We talk about being perfect in Christ. Or to be perfect. Pardon? He wasn't in Christ. He wasn't. He wasn't perfect in Christ, only perfect in himself. He was perfect. In his own eyes. In his own eyes. But Jesus threw it out there and said, here's your perfection. Here's the, the last little bit to do. And you don't have, you don't have to con continue to do it from childhood until now. You don't have years to complete it. You can have it done today. You can have it all. Go sell everything you have and come follow me. He could have had that done in an hour's time. He could have just given it away. And it taken, he'd done everything, everything necessary from his youth. He had done it. He had done, and he's watched himself for years doing it perfectly. And yet what was left to do in a matter of a few blinks of the eye, he had to walk away. Is it hard for some people to finish that last little bit to help to find Christ? Is it that hard? And is it that sometimes, now this individual, again, was perfect from his youth. He'd grown up perfectly. He had done it all. Perfect type, perfect attendance at church. He probably set aside so much money, so much money weekly, probably did what was considered supposed to be his share. Probably, probably did what was expected to be his share. But yet he didn't realize there was one little thing one little thing kept him from eternal life or being absorbed with his own self-centeredness. One little thing. Was it, can a person truly be that blind? Years. Years he'd gone. I say yes. Lots of surveyor in that situation. That's why the story's in the Bible. We're supposed to learn from these stories. Didn't he have the same stories? Wasn't he presented with the same stories? I'm going to tell you, he had to have been presented with the same stories. So this one last story is going to help you and me? Well, I'm sure he was told this. Oh, wait, wait. <laughs> so what? we've got to figure this out. Does, is it, he had the same stories. Yeah, I mean, what I, what I understand is he hadn't submitted to, to God or Jesus at the time. And I think that's what God wants. He wants us to submit to him. Uh, he was kind of self-reliant. So he was relying on his riches to get him by. But when Jesus told him to sell everything, he had to 
give up his self-worth. He wasn't going to be able to be self-sustained. Now he had to depend on Jesus. When he told him, follow me, he didn't know where he was going to eat the next day because he didn't, he wasn't going to have any money. So he was completely submitting to Jesus. And I think that's what God wants from us. We've got to submit. And that's where our salvation comes from, through Jesus. Okay, so the individual, he, uh, he, was, he had done everything so perfect. Everything he had done on his own. And that's where he was in his life. He had fulfilled it all on his own. Everything. Jesus was saying one last thing. Like my brother said, I think the problem of the rich young man was the wrong focus. He, he had all his focus on his wealth, and that was all he could see. He wasn't seen beyond his wealth. And uh, we can tell the story over and over again, but the question is how does it apply to us today? What is our focus? Who do we, I mean, is it our wealth, your intelligence, your wisdom? If anything goes beyond that point, then that cuts you off. The person we talked about on John the Baptist, how could you imagine John the Baptist, who was said to be the forerunner of Jesus, asking the question, are you the Messiah? Why would he ask that question? Because he also had lost the focus. They were all expecting Jesus to come free them from the tyranny of the, the people who are maltreating them. But the, that was not Jesus' focus. So in our lives today, as we worship, as we come to church, are we in church yet losing the focus? So, like you said, the rich young ruler's focus was on himself. John the Baptist's focus was starting to, as he had sat there in jail for so long, in prison for six months, his focus was starting to come to rely on him. Wondering, why, <coughs> why is Jesus, why is he out there tending to all these people, the, uh, the poor, the sick, the lame? Why is it, but yet I'm here in prison, the one, the forerunner, the one that, as he said, uh, I am not worthy to loose his, his shoestrings. And, and then he actually even said, I am to decrease while he is to increase. But yet the idea is that he's out there just messing around with the sick, the poor, the lame, the brokenhearted, all the individuals out there. But yet the, I'm, I'm the important one sitting here in prison. And the, we, he started to lose the focus and the rich young ruler in the same regards. The focus is on me. I have focused my whole life on making sure I have done everything perfect. And Jesus said, you just, there's just one last little thing. You can have it done here today. You can have it done. You can have it all. Just lose that focus on yourself. Get rid of that focus on yourself. Get rid of it. As it was presented at the very beginning of the class, to take the focus off of us and on others. Others. On others. It's where the focus is at. Zacchaeus, Luke 19, 1 through 10. Luke 19, 1 through 10. And then Jesus entered and passed through Jericho. Now behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus who was a chief tax collector, and he was rich. And he sought to see who Jesus was, but he could not because of the crowd, for he was a, of short stature. So he ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was going to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said to him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must stay at your house. So he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. But when they saw it, they all murmured, saying, He has gone to be a guest with a man who is a sinner. And then Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. And if I have taken anything from anyone by false accusation, I restore fourfold. 
And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because he also is the son of Abraham, for the son of man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, Zacchaeus is a rich man. Is he not? He says he is rich. A rich man. He's only going to give half of his money to the poor. I think the last study brought this up. He is only going to give half of his money to the poor, but yet the rich young ruler was told to go sell everything. Zacchaeus was a rich man. The rich young ruler was a rich man. Zacchaeus says, I'm only going to give half of my money to the poor. I'll go and make recompense to the, uh, to the individuals I've stolen from. Jesus said, go with the rich young ruler. It's go get rid of all your stuff. Go give to the poor, and then come follow me. Zacchaeus got off half as easy. Did he? Do you think he gave up everything? Do you think he gave, do you think Zacchaeus gave every last dime away, every last penny that he had away? Do you think that's the finishing aspect of the story? No, he kept some. You're implying he kept some? But it's all right for him to keep some, yet, but yet the rich young ruler is to go give it all away? Is there, is there, you're saying there's a difference, though, between yeah, Zacchaeus. Difference in their hearts. One was selfish and the other one was wanted to give. Wanted to, okay. So we see that in, in Zacchaeus. He, he in, uh, uh, the rich young ruler, Jesus was the person who made the proposition. Go sell all you have. Here in Zacchaeus, he is the one making the proposition. I'm going to do this. He's willing, he's already willing to do this. This other person is not. Correct. The lesson is trying to separate these two kind of rich persons. If you, if you come to think of it, Zacchaeus is even worse than the rich young ruler. He defrauds people. I mean, he, he is hated by the community where he found himself. But yet something in him made him understand that he needed to go beyond where he was, and he made a proposition. I am going to do even fourfold. I know I've taken a lot, but I can't. I'm going to do even fourfold of what I've taken. I'm going to return. He's making this proposition. This is the difference between this young man and Zacchaeus. Okay. Okay. Just to add what the brother said is that... Um, the tax collector, he didn't covet. The rich man coveted. Zacchaeus gave with his heart. The rich man did not have a heart to give. I, I would I'd probably say that Zacchaeus, he coveted or he wouldn't have stolen. Okay. Okay. Okay, so you sense even in the verses that we're reading here, Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, I give half of my goods to the poor. In reading that, it sounds like Zacchaeus is all of a sudden just full of excitement, saying, Look, Lord. I'm excited to say this. It just seems like there's a change in him. Now, if, pa if, the, uh, if Jesus would have told the rich young ruler, go give half of your money to the poor, rich young ruler said, okay, I'll do it. But yet Zacchaeus is more or less implying emphatically, look, Lord, I'm gonna, I have a bright idea. I'm going to go give half of what I have to the poor. We're missing the word if. It says, if I have taken anything. So it makes us think that Zacchaeus was guilty of taking anything just because the other tax collectors did. But if I have, 
I oh. don't think he ever did. I think he was honest. Okay. Oh, okay. Man, you're bringing a totally different story of what we like to think about Zacchaeus. We like to think of him as being mischievous, evil. Okay. Okay. So the the idea is we don't we can't we can't specifically say that he is a cheating tax collector. But we know he's hated because all tax collectors were hated, okay, because they worked for the Romans. They took taxes for the Romans government from the Jewish people. You hated them for that. So it's, we can at least hate him for being a tax collector. And if he did take anything mischievously or by mistake or anything like that, now... He said, if I have taken anything, he does, his implications is he doesn't know, but how is he going to know to go to give any money back to anybody? So maybe he does have some ideas. Maybe he was thinking that uh, uh, maybe he took, he was underneath the guidance and the guidelines of the Roman government was to take so much, and he never asked questions. He did his job just as dutiful as anything. And he's, now he's going to look further into the, finally read the fine print and realize it probably wasn't right for him to take this and maybe he'll go make recompense. So, but the bottom line is, he had an attitude of, of, of uh, regret and sorrow and anything else. If, let's, I'm just going to imply that I think the reason why he has such a strong desire to go help the poor with half his money is I think his, do his job has made him feel guilty in some regards. Why did Well, what? Why, why would he say all of this at this point in time? Because he wanted to do what the Lord asked of the people. He wanted to help the poor. Why wasn't he already doing this? It's just, to me, it sounds like he's all of a sudden saying, Lord, whatever I have, I'm going to give half to the poor. It was almost, he was, it was after he rid of his dignity even and climbed a, a tree, yeah. uh, this wealthy man, his desire was to um, see the Lord. Yeah, to see the Lord, to see his goodness. Where the rich run young man, it was what can I do? What more can I do? What can I do as a it, it was still the I. Uh, how what do I do to earn this? And when he was presented with what to do, that was too much because, you know, of his, of his wealth. Where Zacchaeus was sincerely looking, he had heard all these things, he wanted to really see Jesus, and uh, Jesus invited himself to his home okay. and uh, presented what could be done. Did he present what could be done? Did, what do you mean by he presented? He, he presented that I am the way. Okay. And uh, Zacchaeus then, you know, says, okay, what can I do? Like, uh, let, me, let me do this and give away. I believe in Desire of Ages, it brings out that when Zacchaeus heard of Christ, he had started changing how he interacted with others, even before Jesus seen him and came to his house. So his reaction to hearing about Christ, to meeting Christ, was to have the interest that Christ did in caring for others. Okay. 
he had heard of Christ. He had heard of the miracles Christ Jesus had been doing. He wanted to meet this individual. He's coming through. But isn't it interesting that it comes down to his guilt is about his wealth? He doesn't say, I want to go, I want to, what, he doesn't say that I, I want to go build a house for anybody. He wants to get rid of his wealth. For some reason, the wealth that he has feels like a burden, has just become a burden to him. He wants to give some half of it away to the poor. He wants to make recompense to anybody that he has possibly cheated. I'll use that, possibly. Even though I, I'm wondering if he doesn't have a little bit more of an understanding that he probably did. But yet, his wealth is weighing on him because it, it, it is something that has, that has, feels like it is a corruption with him. And it is because he, you, a Jewish individual to work for the Romans as a tax collector only has one reasoning is they want to become wealthy. And they know they can do that in mischievous ways. So we, we take it that this is weighing on him. Perhaps one of the sermons that he heard was where your treasures are, that's where your heart is. Okay. Very well. But he realizes in the presence of Jesus there's something that he needs to give up. There's some, the thing that is weighing on him most he wants to give up. Because it seems to be something that is taking up all of his time. Is it uh, not to you know take away from the point, but is it possible that um, in his case, and it could apply to some of us today as well, that when he met Jesus, um, maybe there could be some hint of guilt there, I'm sure. But could it also be that he just kind of finally started to realize that my wealth can also be an asset? I can use this to glorify God. So it's not necessarily something being done out of guilt. It's something being done to say, hey, Jesus has given me this additional part of myself that I didn't realize was there before. Now I can use that goodness that he has shown to me to help everybody else. Because if it was just guilt, couldn't he have just given up the post as a tax collector? Because, I mean, it doesn't change the fact that it's still an incredibly oppressive job. Um, at least if we follow the history of the, of the Jews and the Roman occupation and all that, it's still a, a very, you know, taxing job um, for the Jews. Isn't it possible that he's coming from the standpoint, you know what, I'm already in this position, I have all this wealth, I don't need all this wealth, let me use it to glorify God by helping those who actually need Okay, could be. One thing is, is that as he met J Jesus, his focus has changed that he wants to help others. And, and, and he realizes he has the potential to do it. I guess what I'm questioning is just the motive. Yep. Is it that he's decided that he needs to help others out of guilt? Because if that's the case, what, what does that say for us? Is it that we only help others because we feel guilty because of all that we've accrued? Or is it that meeting Jesus now shows me that this is why I've accumulated all this wealth? So that... I can help others that need help. Okay. There's a difference between doing something out of guilt versus doing something out of a genuine love for others. Okay. And Fire Baker says, Zacchaeus had been overwhelmed, amazed, and silenced at the love and uh, condensation of Christ and stooping to him so unworthy. Now love and loyalty to his newfound master unsealed his lips. Okay. So he did see something uh, profound in Christ for himself. Okay. Okay. Let's end with prayer.
Our Heavenly Father, we appreciate the time we can study your word and we can come up with so many different ideas of how important uh, these stories are in our lives and how we can learn from them. But above all else, we, we just admire the fact that, uh, that just meeting you and to see your, your uh, humbleness uh, before us can just make us want to change our lives better for you. Let us continue to, con to change and to take your character into our lives. We thank you in your name. Amen.